So speciations happened. We've had step one where we introduced variation into the population. And step two, there were barriers that were introduced that were preventing those diverging populations from reproducing with one another. But it still happens. Organisms, they might be diverging. They might be accumulating these uh, genes and alleles that differentiate them between the populations. But maybe those reproductive barriers aren't in place yet. Maybe their habitats aren't quite different enough. Maybe their mating rituals or breeding seasons aren't quite different enough to prevent that reproduction. So I could almost call this maybe like step one and a half where, yeah, we've introduced some variation. We have diverging populations but we haven't quite gotten to the point where they're isolated reproductively. And that, that step one and a half, that part is called hybridization. So we're having these two diverging species that are hybridizing or, uh, or reproducing with one another and creating viable offspring. And this is where the definition of species gets a little muddy because you might argue, well, if they can hybridize, then they're not species to begin with. And the reason we call them species is because they're, they're on their way to it. And usually hybridization is really rare. It's rare versus the norm. And because it's rare, scientists will still say, yeah, these are different species, but they might sometimes hybridize. So the way hybridization works um, really kind of depends. So there's three different ways hybridization can impact speciation. So of the three ways, all of them are the same in the sense that we have two diverging species that sometimes reproduce with one another. They're not reproductively isolated yet. Now the three different ways of hybridization, what I mean by that is really what happens to the hybrids? What happens to these offspring of these diverging organisms? And so the header I have for the next couple of slides is speciation directions. As in, do we keep speciating? Do we not keep speciating? What, what happens? And you're going to see diagrams like this on all of the slides. And I recommend that you draw those in your notes. So the first type of hybridization that we see is reinforcement hybridization. And so what this means is that the hybrids that are created by these two diverging populations they're not great. They're, they're not better adapted to the environment. Um, usually, for the most part, uh, in reinforcement speciation, the hybrids that are formed do poorly, uh, do poorer than the parent species, the species A diverting and species B diverting. That species A and B are doing great. They escape predation. They get enough food. They're reproductively viable. But then you have this hybrid in between that just lacks those skills, lacks that ability to blend in, lacks that ability to reproduce or reproduce as viably as the other species. So if we were to diagram this, you guys can kind of watch where my pointer goes. So here's that common ancestor. You see that common ancestor starts diverging. So they've introduced variation. Hybridization is happening here in the beginning, so early on in, the, in that divergence. But you see this blue area representing hybrids dies out. It, 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 it doesn't keep going. It, it ends. Those hybrids are not going to be super plentiful. A great example of this are these guys. So here on the left is a polar bear, and on the right is a grizzly bear. Because of climate change, the polar bear is actually going onto the grizzly bear habitat a lot more. Not a lot, but just more. Grizzly bears and polar bears actually share a fairly recent common ancestor, and they actually can reproduce with one another. But before, they used to have habitat isolation. You have polar bears that are on these ice sheets. You have grizzly bears that are in these dense evergreen forests. So they never crossed paths. We consider them different species because they didn't reproduce with one another. But because of climate change, polar bears are starting to get pushed away from the sea ice because there isn't any. And they're interacting with grizzly bears. And sometimes, rarely, but sometimes, they end up reproducing and they do create a viable offspring. This third picture is a posley bear, or um, some people call it a prisley bear. It's... It's unofficial. We've only found like nine of these. So this is a really rare occurrence. 
Now, if you look at this Posley bear, you probably notice that it's not white, so it's not blending into the ice sheet, so it's going to make it harder to hunt there. But it's also not dark brown, meaning it's not going to blend into these dark woods of these evergreen forests, meaning, again, predation becomes a lot harder. You might be able to tell the this Posley bear has a much larger build, and while you might think, oh, it's a predator, larger the better. Yeah, not when you're running. Um, the larger you are, usually the slower you are. And so this is a case where, yes, we might have these posley bears, we might have um, these hybrids, but they're not surviving in the environment. They're not going to be reproducing more than grizzly bears or more than polar bears. They just, they're not really well adapted to the environment. And so I guess evolution is also, is almost pushing for the speciation because there's no going back. Um, the, the hybrid or the middle ground just isn't well adapted for the environment. So this is one thing that can happen. You can hybridize, but the hybrid hybrids don't really survive. Another direction that speciation can go is stability hybridization. And so what this means is that you've got your hybrids, that's being represented here in this blue. So this is the crossing of species A and species B, or the parent species. But the hybrids are actually just as fit, meaning they can get just as much food. They can escape as much predation. They can build their nests. They can um, find protection. They can reproduce just as well as the two parent species. Now keep in mind, as fit, not fitter, not getting more food, not doing better than their parents, just, yeah, if the species A and species B hybridize, okay, then they all coexist together. And we do find this. Now, again, this is going to be one of those where you might think, well, if they can make offspring and the offspring are doing just as well, why in the world are we calling these different species? And this is because it's not happening for the entire species. So let me show you what I mean. So the map you're looking at is the eastern United States, and we're looking at the range of the black-capped chickadee and the Carolina chickadee. And if you look at these two pictures, you can tell they are very, very similar to one another. In yellow, so I'm kind of tracing it with my, um, with my cursor, in yellow is their hybrid zone. This is where black-capped chickadees and Carolina chickadees um, overlap in their ranges, and sometimes they re reproduce. Sometimes they create these hybrids, and those hybrids kind of chill there in that hybrid zone. But the reason these are still called two different species, despite the fact that they can reproduce, despite the fact that they make viable offspring, is that's the exception, right? This is not happening over their entire range. I mean, look at how large the ranges are for each of these birds individually. It's only a small little area where there's hybridization happening. But black-capped chickadee, much better adapted to these cold environments. The Carolina, these much warmer environments. And these hybrids really only exist in that hybrid zone. Uh, they're very specialized to that one small area. Now, what's um, in this video, I am not going to show it um, during this video. You're going to see a link pop up in a second. But take a look at this video. This video gives you uh, just a little bit, I guess, stronger idea or I don't know, honestly, it's just better imagery um, than a still picture. So watch this video, learn a little bit more about these different chickadees. There's really not any new information you need to write down from this video, uh, but this is a good stopping point just to watch it and just learn about some of the science going on examining these two very closely related birds. So go ahead, pause this YouTube video. You're going to be seeing a link popping up above me that's going to take you to the YouTube video that you see linked on here. So pause here, click on this link, watch that video, and then come back here. So if that research seemed interesting to you, that is something you can do. So just learning about hybridization, not just in chickadees, but in organisms all across the world. And it's really cool kind of pairing what's happening to our environment and how changes that humans have made to our environment impact things like hybridization, uh, which I think is pretty cool. So our last type of hybridization that can happen is fusion hybridization. So in this case, here's our common ancestor. 
we're starting to diverge into two different species. The blue is representing those hybrids. But you notice in this diagram that species one and species two are actually coming back together. And the reason that happens is that the hybrids that are being made between these diverging, diverging species are actually uh, doing better. The hybrids can get more food, can escape predation, can hunt better, can reproduce more. They can do X, Y, Z better. They are literally out-competing their parents. And so natural selection fa favors that. And what I mean by that is species A, you know, if it reproduces with more of species A, those offspring likely not to survive. But if species A breeds with species B, well, their offspring are more likely to survive. And so it's not necessarily species A thinking, huh, let me get with species B. Like, we're going to make some nice kids. They, they don't recognize this is happening. Instead, what it is, is just natural selection is killing off, so to speak, the offspring of species A and the offspring of species B and the ones that are surviving, the ones that are reproducing more are the ones that are hybridizing. Now, there's, it's hard to come up with examples of these, or I shouldn't say come up, but find these examples in nature. Because for all of these, I'm going to backtrack a little bit. For all of these, these processes are taking millions of years. But you and I are existing for like a hundred years, and, and that's about it. And so what you and I are seeing is a snapshot into evolutionary history. And the snapshot we're looking at is the end of these arrows. We see species A, we see species B, and we see these hybrids. So at a single point in time, we're seeing what's along this red line. In a single point in time, we're seeing species A, hybrids, and species B. We are seeing that right now. But with fusion, I'm going to put my line at the same place. All I see is just a single species. We would have to know a lot about the evolutionary history of that species to be like, oh, yeah, that's fusion. This is what happened because we're not seeing right here or most of the time we're not seeing right here. We're seeing, you know, the end product. We're like, ah, this is a giraffe. Well, for all we know, the giraffe was a diverging species and it was fusion hybridization. And what we see is the hybrid, but we don't really know that. That that doesn't really fossilize and humans haven't been around nearly long enough to see that happen. But we do have some examples. So here you can just call them fish N and fish P. Totally fine. <laughs> so fish N, so the N's coming from its species name. Um, so these organisms, fish N, these, uh, this population was, uh, oh my goodness, sorry, I keep tripping over my words. We have these two different species. They were starting to speciate. So this was the divergence of a common ancestor. In one direction, we had fish N. This is a very brightly colored fish. It has this bright red and this yellow, really great for sexual selection. It was used for mate choice. So females were choosing the males that were these bright colory uh, type um, coloration. Now, it's similar species. You can even tell looking at the body type and even some of the coloring. So we had a divergence. We had the super bright colored ones using sexual selection. And then we had these other guys. Um, so these in, in the, the species P. And species P were a lot more drab, but they're a little bit faster. So they, they weren't really outshining anyone, but instead uh, were able to just catch food a little bit more efficiently. And so they were kind of doing great in their habitat, just in a different way. So we had this kind of speciation that was happening. However, because of humans, humans actually drove fusion. So these fish are living in different creeks and in different ponds. They are coexisting together. Granted, for the most part, they're separated. They're not interacting with each other. But humans come in and started polluting these waters. And the problem with polluting these waters is that if you're a very brightly colored fish, like um, this fish N is, you're going to stick out a lot. Um, and, and, and you stick out in a not so good way, in a, oh, predators are going to find you way. And you're no longer looking pretty anymore. Like you're, you're in drabby water. Other fish can't even see 
that. So your, your, your females that you're trying to attract, you're no longer attracting anymore. They don't see your bright colors, but you stick out enough that predators are going to find you. Now, predators might have found them in the past, but at least they are reproducing, right? So they might be dying due to predation because they stick out, but they were attracting all the ladies. And so therefore they were reproducing to make up for that. But in these really turbid waters, they just get the more predation and not enough ladies. With these more drab guys, sure, they blended in in the water more, but because the water uh, wasn't um, as clear, they weren't seeing their prey as much. And so these guys were kind of suffering as well. Now, because the water was mercurier, these guys reproduced with one another. Honestly, it could probably just be because they didn't quite recognize each other. It's like, I think, I think that's Sue over there. I'm not quite sure. It's really, it's really foggy in these waters. So they were probably reproducing with one another, honestly, without even knowing. And what they were creating was this, this hybrid individual that had some coloring, so the females might see that, but it was a lot more drab. They weren't sticking out to predators anymore, but there was still a hint of that color that females could see. They were able to also see better. Now this was over many generations, but their eyesight were getting better. And this was happening a lot faster with those that could blend in. So the offspring of species A, the offspring of species B, not surviving as well for various reasons, but the hybrids had a leg up. They blended in more. And because they blended in more, natural selection could act on them in other ways as well. So again, it's really hard to see these examples in nature. Uh, and it's really hard to find them just because we exist at the end of the road, right? We exist at a snapshot in time. But it does happen. We do have hybrids that actually end up doing better than their parents, typically because there's environmental changes something has happened in the environment and what species A and what species B are doing aren't the best ones adapted for that. So with hybridization, again, we have three different forms of hybridization. We could have reinforcement where the hybrids just don't do as well as the parents and hybridization rarely happens. You have stability where hybridization actually happens and the offspring do just as fine. But the reason we don't call them all the same species is it's typically in a small area. It's not through the entirety of the range of those organisms. And then finally, fusion speciation is where your diverging species are hybridizing with one another and the hybrids are actually doing better than species A or species B. The hybrids are actually better adapted for that environment, typically a changing environment. Therefore, our end result is just one species, species A and species B and the hybrids kind of all fuse into one. And that's really the only one that we see. So again, thinking about speciation, that, you know, hybridization doesn't mean speciation doesn't happen. It's almost the, these are the exceptions. This is in times where species A and species B, well, yeah, they do create fertile offspring. And so this is just kind of exploring that idea of, okay, if they make fertile offspring, are they the same species? No, they're not. Hybrids are a rarity, not a commonality.